Uh, next speaker is Jewa Lai. He's from University of Chicago. He is a graduate student of Lekhang Lim. Uh, he has recently disproven uh, this interesting conjecture, which has a uh, deep uh, uh, relationship with machine learning. Uh, and he's going to talk about uh, non commutative uh, arithmetic geometry mean conjecture is false. Yeah. Go ahead, thanks. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, so uh, during the talk, you can just interrupt me uh, any time, and I will uh, in the in the middle of the talk, I will check the chat and see if there is any question in the chat. So, so, um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, uh, this paper about uh, non-commutative arithmetic geometry mean conjecture. Uh, Let's start from uh, introductions. Uh, so first of all, this question actually comes from the machine learning community. So in machine learning, we usually we want to uh, optimize uh, a function, which uh, usually takes this form, which is a empirical risk minimization problem. And so uh, one of the most popular method is the stochastic gradient descent, which uh, at each step, you take one uh, one sample and you you uh, go through the negative gradient di direction and try to minimize the objective function. Uh, there's one uh, one choice in this uh, method, which is the the choice of i. So as you can imagine, uh, we actually have two. Uh, equally popular ways to choose the sample. Uh, the first one is called sampling with replacement, which is said, which is to say that each time we sample i from one to n uniformly and independently. And the second way is uh, sampling without replacement, which is uh, to say that we choose fi from a pool, which is one to n uniformly. And if fi is chosen, then we remove it from a pool and then do the next step. So after n step, we will choose all uh, samples from the pool and then we can uh, restart again. So uh, usually for strongly convex functions, uh, the convergence rate of the second algorithm is better. So usually uh, if the convergence rate of the first algorithm is uh, big O of, uh, one over t, then the convergence rate of the second algorithm would be big O of uh, one over t square. So there's a, a big difference between the two algorithms. Uh, now let's consider another algorithms in linear algebra, which is, uh, so in here we want to solve a, a overdetermined linear system, Cx equals to b. Uh, so, we have a very large, uh, very la uh, we have uh, many rows and columns. And so uh, in this case, we want, we actually can do something very similarly to SGD. So we, uh, each step, we randomly select one rows of the, the big matrix C. So we select, for example, CI, and then uh, we just project uh, xk to to a uh, uh, orthogonal uh, subspace. So uh, maybe you can see the just see the, the the second equation. So basically, the case error will be a projection of the uh, of the previous error. So this projection matrix is the uh, orthogonal projector onto the span of uh, the orthogonal space of C, uh, the orthogonal complement of C. So uh, in this algorithm, each step you uh, project the error. So the error is decreasing. And then you can imagine after many iterations, the, the error will converge to zero and you finally successfully solve the equation. And by very easy uh, computations, uh, you don't need to use any ma matrix decomposition. So uh, now there's a, uh, Conjecture, 
uh, inspired by the, the previous discussion. So as you can see, at each step here, you multiply the error by a matrix. So, so we can actually, we, can, we have also two ways to choose uh, CI here. We can choose CI randomly, uniformly, and dependently, or we can choose CI from a pool and uh, sample with out replacement. So now uh, here's a conjecture. So let's say we have n uh, positive safety and free matrices and we have a matrix norm. Usually we will take uh, the spatial norm or two norm. And then uh, on the left-hand side, we have uh, the sample with replacement. So we can just take the symmetric product of A1 to AM uh, with degree just N. So we have N variables, we have degree M. So we can take the, the symmetric product of it and we form a big matrix here. And on the right-hand side, we take the distinct uh, symmetry product. So again, we have n variables and we take the degree n product and we sum over them. And then we take a norm and we take an average. So again, you can see that uh, if all a are just scalars and then we reduce to the uh, very uh, elementary so-called arithmetic geometric mean uh, inequality. But if A are all matrices and they are non-commutative, then uh, this is something very uh, actually non-trivial to, to prove or disprove. Uh, so let's see a very uh, low degree case, which is uh, the two, two degree and two variable case. So the proof is basically one night proof. So let's say if A is larger or equal to B, if A minus B is probably the same different. And then uh, we have this inequality. So AB plus BA is less than A, A squared plus B squared. And then two AB plus BA is less than A plus B squared. So we have one night proof here, which is say that, for example, here, the right hand side minus left hand side equals to A minus B squared, which is larger than zero. So uh, QED here. Uh, so in a 2 d case, this is a very trivial problem and uh, there's, uh, uh, we don't need to say uh, more, more, more about it. And now what about the, the higher degree case? So uh, we have some remarks here. If the conjecture holds, then it is sharp because we can choose all AI to be the same. Uh, if the and we just proved the degree two case. And then uh, in 2018, uh, there's a proof by uh, Zhang, uh, which is the degree three case and for the two norm. In fact, uh, we first do a little generalization, which is to say that uh, Zhang, Zhang's proof holds for n, uh, for n is a multiplier of three, but we can generalize it to all n. So, for all degree, for degree three and the number of variables is uh, arbitrary. Uh, but what about a uh, follow more for four and five dimensional case? And let's see uh, a reformulation of a problem. So because we are, we can, we are doing the, the spatial norm, we can say that we can transform the problem to a equivalent form. So assume the sum of all a i a one to a n is less than uh, n times i. Then uh, our our desired inequality is of this form. So basically, uh, if we know this, then then the left hand side is less than i, and so the right hand side is less than one. And then the right hand side is less than one means that the the largest eigenvalue and the smallest eigenvalue has a bound one. Okay, so. This is just very true uh, reformulation. And then uh, this formulation looks like a polynomial optimization. And now we can use a very, I would say very, uh, uh, very common use tool from polynomial optimization. So let me talk about a little more about polynomial optimization. Uh, Oh yeah, so <laughs> let me talk first about uh, so-called positive standards in polynomial optimization. Uh, first of all, I believe all of you are familiar with the newer standards. So if we uh, do have a algebraic set, 
defined by some equations, then what's the condition of f fringe on v? And then the answer is that uh, f is in the, the ideal, the radical ideal generated by f1 to fn. This is uh, well known. And uh, what's the positive sense us, which is say that we want, we have a semi algebraic set S defined by, uh, by F1 uh, and Fn are positive in this set. What's the condition of F being positive on S? Uh, we have also a non-negative version called uh, Nick negative stance us. Uh, so this is a very complicated uh, problem. Uh, which is also known as the Hilbert 17th problem. Uh, if the number of variables are just one, then F is a sum of squares. But if the number of variables are two, then it is no longer uh, very simply as a sum of squares. It can be, you can of have other, other forms. Uh, I think the first counter example is in uh, degree six. Uh, in polynomial optimization, this complication leads to the so-called LaSalle hierarchy. So basically, uh, you can define uh, a sequence of convex relax, uh, relax to, the, to the original problem, and then you can solve it uh, by, by pushing the degree higher and higher and solve it more accurately. And you, you can, the best hope is that you can only get an approximate a solution. Uh, so, uh, however, there's a very uh, beautiful result in non-commutative case, which is the so-called uh, non-commutative positive standards. So, first of all, uh, I will introduce the notations later, but let's just look at the, 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 the general form here. We have left hand side, which is uh, more or less a uh, semi algebraic set and, uh, and a positive condition, and the right hand side, which is a SOS set, sum of square set. So, in non commutative case, a positive means sum of squares and vice versa. So, this is very good in non commutative variables. So, let me introduce the notations here. Uh, assume we have a uh, n non-commutative variables x1 to xn. So this basically means that x1, xi, xj is not equal to xj, xi. Uh, and then we can say what's the monomial or word of dense D, which is the, uh, just uh, we have D variables and we multiply them together. And then we can define what's a polynomial ring of non-commutative variables. And then we can, uh, and then we denote the polynomial ring uh, with a subscript D be the set of polynomials of degree less than D. So this is a vector space. Uh, uh, it's easy to see that this vector space is dimensioned uh, one plus N plus N square and so on and plus N to the D. So we can, again, we can find the dictionary base by monomials. Uh, we also have a transpose operation on functions defined by uh, reversing the order of all words and extending by linearity. So we just reversing the order of words. This is a so-called transpose. And then if f transpose equals f, then the polynomial is called symmetric. And now uh, here is the, the definition of semi-algebraic set. Uh, in here, uh, I. The, the theorem only holds for, for linear conjunct, or you can extend it a little to the convex conjunct or the, the degree two conjunct. So, but let me, uh, let me use linear conjunct here. So let's say if we have a finite set of linear conjuncts L1 to LK, and then what's the uh, feasible set BL? It is the set of all real symmetric matrices uh, satisfied this conjunct. Okay, so this is uh, just straightforward. And let's assume uh, this uh, feasible set has non-empty interior and bounded. Uh, of course, uh, as you will imagine, uh, in optimization, we usually want the feasible set to, to have some regularity as we, 
otherwise a degenerate physical state will usually we usually don't have any dual or or very good uh, algorithm on it. And so let's just assume it has non vectorial bounding. And now let's say uh, let's consider the so-called SOS set, the sum of square set, which is uh, the set of polynomials uh, which can be written as this form. So in the left we have f i j transpose. On the middle we have l i. So the linear conjoint here. On the right we have f i j. So uh, if we know that f i is larger than zero, and then for any f i j, the whole term is larger than zero. Right, so this is obvious. So any uh, polynomial in this uh, in this uh, sum of square set uh, is uh, behaves well in the physical set. Any polynomial in here uh, is is uh, non non negative in the uh, in this uh, BL. And uh, it's repeat the previous uh, results. So if we have a symmetric polynomial is degrees less than 2d plus 1. And then assume the physical set is has non infinity and bounded. And then it is positive, it is non negative on the physical set if and only if it has, uh, it can be written as sum of squares. So the little d uh, shows up here. So fij has degree of at most d. Uh, so this is a very good news. And then after this theorem, so this theorem is only proved, I think, in 2012. So it's a relative, I would say, new theorem. Uh, and then our uh, problem immediately uh, gets uh, transformed into another sum of square term. So let's say we have linear conjoints x1 x to xn and uh, n minus x1 to xn. So which just means that we we know in our problem x y is positive seven different, uh, and uh, the sum of all x i is less than n i, right? So this is the linear conjoint, and then we want to write our uh, distinct symmetry product as a sum of squares, and I write an additional lambda here, which indicates the the bounds on the largest and smallest eigenvector. So. So in here, lambda one is the uh, is the largest eigenvector, and here lambda two is the smallest eigenvector. So uh, actually, the, the absolute value of the smallest eigenvector. So we want both lambda one and lambda two is less than uh, some some constant. So this constant doesn't really mean much. It's just a, a, a average showing in the in the combinatorial uh, number. And then again, this is all very familiar in polynomial optimization. If we have a sum of squares, we can transform a sum of square into a semi-definite programming. Uh, so let me uh, let me expand this a little bit. So if we are given a, a function f, then we can represent f as a scalar vector times the, the best. Okay, so beta is the base of uh, this space. So beta is just one and x1 and x2, and then x1 square and x1, x2, and so on and so on. And so f is, uh, is the base times uh, a scalar vector, uh, uh, sorry, uh, a vector in, in just, just a real vector. And then, so this, uh, this sum of squares can be uh, written out. So we say fij equal to uij transpose times beta. And then we uh, move uij to right, and then right is this form. And now the the quantity here, this sum of uij uij transpose, is nothing but the semi-definite matrices. So we call the term in the in this uh, this term as some uh, some matrix. For example, we can call it as uh, di. And then what we got is that trace d i times uh, same definite matrices. And now the, the final problem is here. If uh, let's say beta is a, a base of uh, this uh, vector space, and let's, let's say xn plus y equals to this. And then we let number one to be the minimum value of SDT. 
the SDB is defined as lambda subject to this whole conjoint. So in here, this is just a repetition. Uh, this is just a repeat of the previous formulation. And we have y1 to yn is larger than zero. So uh, why this is a, a, a familiar SDP? Um, because the conjoint here are all linear. Although it seems not very linear, but it's actually very linear. Uh, as we can see here, all x, xi are just non-commutative variables. They are not any specific matrices. They are just uh, abstract non-commutative variables. So this equation means that two non-commutative polynomials are equal, which means that all their coefficients are equal. So in the left-hand side, we have many coefficients. On the right-hand side, we have many coefficients. And for each coefficient, we get a conjoint. So after we combine all the conjoints, they are all linear, and we get a linear system. So this STP is just a minimum lambda subject to a linear system and a semi-definite positive conjoint. And this is a familiar SDP. And then uh, let's give our results. So this is a table computed by SDP programming. Uh, let's see, uh, number one. Number one is the largest eigenvalue, right? Number two is the smallest, uh, the, absolute, the absolute value of the smallest eigenvalue. And so, so this is actually negative. So, so this is actually negative one half, negative. Uh, uh, three over two and so on. And so, and here the last column is the required constant. And in a degree two case, which we have proved, this is of obvious true. And this constant is a uh, matrix this constant. So this bound is sharp as we know. And then uh, up to degree four and, uh, and variable number is four and five, this is also seems right, but in degree five and number of variable is five, uh, we see the variation here. So 144 is larger than 120. So we can found and we can find a, a small eigenvalue, which is as small as minus 144 and violate our conjecture before. And then, of course, you can imagine that this SDP is, is very uh, hard to solve because the number of variables grows exponentially. And I do a little computation on the, on the higher degree case, let's say degree six case. And then the storage alone will take uh, 26 billion 40 numbers, which is very infeasible. Uh, for even for modern computers. So basically degree five is the best thing we can do numerically, but very fortunately degree five already implies a common example here. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about number two here. Number two is the smallest eigenvalue. And we see that in degree two case, uh, number two is actually one quarter of number one. So let me uh, give you a very cute uh, little theorem. So let's say A1 to N are positive semi-definite matrices and A1 to N is less than N. And then we have a lower bound on the least eigenvalue, which is this form. So they are, so the, the for example, if, uh, if N equals two, A1 plus A2 is less than two I. And then in here we have, uh, a1, A2 plus A2, A1 is larger than minus uh, half I, half I and T. So how to prove it? Uh, in fact, it's very easy. We can just uh, see what's the output of the YI here. So because we, we solve the SDP, we, we actually know what's the optimal YI here. And then we can look at this YI and we can try to do a numerical uh, decomposition, numerical rank decomposition. So, and then the result is as follows. We decompose it as this sum of squares, this sum of squares, this sum of squares, this sum of squares, this sum of squares. And then we sum over all this thing IJK if possible. And then the final inequality 
So we, after we sum over all possible inequalities, all we get is uh, this uh, inequality. So this is a proof here. And this proof, you, I, I would say you, you cannot possibly know how to prove it uh, unless you successfully solve a SDP. Uh, and final remark uh, is that uh, very recently, in fact, just last month in, uh, in new law rips, uh, there's a new paper provide, actually provide a counter example for M equals N equals five. So our previous proof are strictly non-constructive. You cannot know any information about what possibly a non a counter example could be, but uh, in this paper, they provide a counter example. And so in their counter example, uh, indeed it is uh, the case M equals N equals five. And indeed the smallest second value is 142, so which is as expected, uh, lower than our 144 bound. And then very interesting, the coin example also shows a variation of number one. So the largest eigenvalue can be larger than the, the expected content. And then this uh, coin example shows up in, in degree 29. So, uh, here are some reference and uh, I will end my talk here. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Jiwa. Uh, we have some time for questions. Is there any question have, for, go ahead. I have a, a question. Um, so, so in the counter example, you you find in uh, so for m equal five and n five equal five. Yeah. You you solve the SDP problem. Yeah. With some uh, with some tools. So what? So these tools first they are numerical. They provide some approximation. So mm -hmm. can you certify that the for instance the optimum the lambda that you find is a, is the a correct one or is within a, a good uh, interval and can you recover maybe exact uh, exact data exact uh, value for the variables which will certify that you have a counter example yeah yeah so so as i said this is the uh, this STP form uh, we provide is very non-constructive because um, those uh, x1 to xm are just abstract non commutative variables. And so if you say that, okay, we want to find a common example, for example, satisfy the 144 conjoint. And what, we, what you will get is uh, something of this form. We will see that, so let's say we have a SOS decomposition here. Okay, so this is the STP decomposition. And now what's the condition that the equality holds? So the equality holds is actually not equal to zero. It's, it is saying that you have a, a small eigenvalue, which is zero, right? Mm -hmm. So in here, we actually don't know much about AJ. We just know that this expression has, is degenerate, has, is not for rank matrix. That's all we know. So we actually don't know a uh, lot of from the SDP. Uh, but but the, so you use some tools for, for solving this, uh, for computing this lambda. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what, what, what is it, what are, what is this tool that you use? Uh, uh, Semi-definite programming. Yes, uh, yeah. some solver. So they, they have, they do some uh, numerical error on the, mm. they work within some precision. Oh yeah, a precision problem. Yeah, we actually, uh, yeah, so we, we don't have a good way to control the precision of uh, SDP. So we just know numerically it's, it's, it's approximate that value, but uh, there are no exact SDP solver because all its SDP solver are approximate. Yeah, sure, sure. yeah and uh, perhaps it's, on, it's even a, a NP-hard problem. So <laughs> there's not really a good way to solve exact SDP. 
And, but I would say that uh, from this table, uh, our SDP is quite accurate. I can only say it empirically because all the left-hand side match the expect value and the right-hand side uh, is also quite good because we can even prove uh, an those two case uh, precisely. And that's all we can say. Okay, thank you.